السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. Thank you all for braving the rain and joining us. May Allah increase us in knowledge. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وأفضل الصلاة وأتم التسليم على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين سبحانك لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت الحكيم العليم الله من شر علينا رحمتك وأنزل علينا حكمتك يا ذا الجلال والإكرام uh, We have arrived بفضل الله وبرحمته through Allah's mercy to the very last session on the life of Prophet Ibrahim كان أمة قانتا لله حنيفا There are so many profound lessons that we can gain from the life of Ibrahim. In many ways, it mirrors the life of our Messenger, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and we find much of the same characteristics within his personality, which we'll discuss at the end, inshallah. Today, the verses that we'll mostly be focusing are in Surah Hud, in which he receives the angels and they have a mission of delivering two pieces of news and bearing two gifts. And this is also from the symmetry of the Qur'an. We notice that oftentimes there's a matching number. Um, as you know, last lesson we talked about how Ibrahim showed gratitude um, with regard to two great tests that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala imposed on him and in which he surrendered. Of course, the second was the greater of the two tests, and that was the test of him seeing in a vision as Allah said in Surah Al-Safat. Jazakallah. And then we also talked about how he was ordered to establish a house of worship as a symbol of Tawheed, a symbol of unity. So there should be a focal point. Um, Allah says, and this is relevant because as you know, we're very close to completing our construction of uh, our activity building. ICCP, as you know, we completed all of the structural elements and now we're entering into a new phase also by Allah's grace. So as they were establishing the, the building, they were renewing their intention and they were dedicating that to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we are also at a kind of similar milestone. So we should be reminded by those words. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions that. وَإِذْ يَرْفَعُ إِبْرَاهِيمُ الْقَوَاعِدَ مِنَ الْبَيْتِ وَإِسْمَعِيلُ رَبَّنَا تَقَبَّلْ مِنَّا إِنَّكَ أَنْتَ السَّمِيعُ الْعَلِيمُ And so there's similar verses in Surah Al-Baqarah and also in Surah Ibrahim. Uh, this is Ayah 127. And remember when Ibrahim raised the foundation of the house with Ismail, both praying our Lord, accept this from us. You are indeed the all-hearing, the all-knowing. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that this will also be a focal point for the believers in this area and that it will continue to remain as a house dedicated to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala until the Day of Judgment. We also talked about how the Kaaba was established and the Black Stone and what's special about the Black Stone. And as a result of, of this establishing the house, and Ibrahim calling the people <coughs> and every single person on the face of the earth, both those who were present in the time and all future generations who were destined to respond to that call and to receive it, they also they answered that call. So when we go there, we're fulfilling our reservation. We have already answered that call and now we are putting it into actual practice. And so as a result, hundreds of millions of people have made pilgrimage, whether it is the greater pilgrimage of the Hajj or the lesser pilgrimage of the Umrah, you cannot go there except if Allah invites you. And if you, when you are there, you're not going under any government, you're not going under any delegation, it's not because of a visa, it's because you are Buyufur Rahman. It's because you are the guests of the most merciful. And so that is something which is very special. Um, but as you know, the adventures of Ibrahim are not complete. There's more. I mean, he's like this global traveler, and he's multicultural, multilingual. Um, and, you know, it's, this is like a prelude to globalization, right? This is before borders impede people from traveling. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala orders Ibrahim to go back to his other wife, Sarah. 
And as you know, he was very, very generous. He would never have a meal alone. This is one of the most famous things that we know about Ibrahim, and we find this in all the religious traditions, that they say that Ibrahim is that he wouldn't eat alone. In fact, his house was on the main road, and he would go out every day, and he would look for people who would be guests in his house in order to always have a guest. So one day there were three uh, individuals, three very good looking individuals who came and he received them as a guest. And so it looked like they knew where they're coming. So he asked his wife, he said, do you know who they are? She said, no, I don't know who they are. They just came as a guest. And so he wanted to serve them something that he doesn't know where they're coming from. He doesn't know what their purpose is. He doesn't know anything about them, but he, by virtue of them being his guest, he went into the house. He says, is there anything that we have to eat? Anything that we can serve our guest. And she says, yes, we have a little bit of meat. Right? So it's the first thing. Do we have any leftovers? Can we heat anything up? So, I mean, these are practical things that come up in our own lives. So she says, yes. So most people would have stopped. Right? Okay, we have some food. Let's warm it up. Put it on a nice plate. And that's it. But he says, no. He says, let's slaughter a calf. Right? And not just any calf. Bi'ijilin sameen. Right? He slaughters this fat calf, a nice one. So he's like, okay, get the one in the back, the one that's nice and healthy. And he goes ahead and he slaughters it. And he orders the servants to cook it over time because now you have this ajil. So now you have this calf. So they make the whole setup. They put it on a spit. They put it on the fire. And they cook it up, right? This entire calf. And this is the kind of setup that you would expect if you're going to like a wedding, to an aqiqah, if there's a formal delegation, somebody's coming who's very important. But it must be important because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is mentioning it in the Quran, right? I mean, who really cares what the menu was, right? There's a reason that Allah is going into this detail about Ibrahim putting all these preparations just for three people. Right? So he's doing all of that because of three individuals and three people who he doesn't know. That means that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is emphasizing the hospitality and generosity of the Prophet uh, Ibrahim alayhi salam to the people that he knew and also to the people that he didn't know. One of the, this is just a side observation. I noticed that many of us are generous to the people whom we know. Or we go out of our way to greet the people who we know. But we ignore those who we don't know. And when it comes to salam, for example, it's actually more important to greet and to say salam to those ala man arafta or ala man lam ta'rif. Those who you know and those who you didn't know. And that's one of the wonderful practices that our community has is that generally if you come to ICCP, especially on Friday, that there will be someone who will meet you and greet you. Um, especially for new people that come to the community, they always remark how that really helped them get introduced and to meet people when they first came and they didn't know anyone. So I think this is uh, following up on that tradition. And in fact, the Arabian uh, culture strongly emphasized, there was an entire genre of poetry that was dedicated to generosity to strangers, right? So the idea that there would be an open tent is very important. And actually, you, fee, you, you see that um, uh, actually there's an interfaith program which is called Abraham's Tent, right? So also in Jewish texts as well and in the Hebrew Bible, their description of Prophet Ibrahim is very, very similar, that he has the same attributes of generosity. Um, and so that's something that they emphasize as well. So this is something that we have in common. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Hud, this is ayah number 67. So if you want to follow along because we'll be going continuously with these verses. In ayah number 69, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَقَدْ جَاءَتْ رُسُلُنَا إِبْرَاهِيمَ بِالْبُشْرَى قَالُوا سَلَامًا قَالَ سَلَامًا فَمَا لَبِثَ أَن جَاءَ بِعِجْلٍ حَنِيذٍ And surely our messenger angels came to Abraham with good news of a son. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I, I mean this is so interesting. 
uh, Allah gives us like a sneak peek. Because the people in that situation, well, they're not people, right? As you know, they're angels. Or the angels and Ibrahim, this the situ- scenario has not played out yet. So they don't necessarily know what's going to happen. But Allah is telling us a sneak peek that this is the scene. That they are meeting Ibrahim. جَاءَتْ رُسُلُنَا إِبْرَاهِيمَ بِالْبُشْرَى They're coming with good news, right? And that is the good news of a son. But before they even go any farther, قَالُوا salama. So they begin with the greetings of peace. So this is the greetings of Jannah, this is the greetings of the angels. قَالَ salam. And he replied, peace be upon you. As you all know, the first salam when you meet people, this is in, 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 in fiqh, in, in, in the law. What is the first salam? Which category does it fall into? Is it mandatory? Is it recommended? Is it mubah? Is it neutral? Is it discouraged? What is it? So is the first salam mandatory? It's a good question. Right? Do you have to say salam to everyone that you meet? So I'm seeing some hesitant no's. This is actually correct. It's not mandatory. There might be situations in which you're preoccupied with something or you're, you know, can you imagine... A, uh, a doctor is walking into the operation theater and he has to say salam to all the nurses and all the staff. No, he's like focused on something. So there will be situations in which you may not be able to say salam to everyone. But when somebody says salam to you, then it, what is the status of the reply? Then it is mandatory. Allah says that in the Quran, إِذَا حُيِّيتُمْ بِتَحِيَّةٍ فَحَيُّوا بِأَحْسَنَ مِنْهَا so once you have received a, 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 a tahiyya, a greeting, then you must return it either at the similar level of greeting or better than it. So if somebody says, this is why personally some people, they say, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, which is a beautiful way to meet someone. It shows uh, generosity in speech and warmth and everything. But personally, I don't do that. I mean, I admire people who do, but I don't do that. Why, why is it that I don't do that? Exactly. The reason is I want to leave a little bit of a blank. Because if, if, if I take all the reward and I go straight for 10 out of 10, then I'm not leaving anything for the other person. So if you say, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. So then you left a little bit there. So the person will respond, Wa alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Right? So it's like giving you know it's like giving somebody a layup so they can you know take the take the easy reward. So we see that in their interactions. He says salam and then he responds qalu qala salam. So he says peace be upon you as well. Then Allah subhanahu wa taala fama labitha. Again, Allah is emphasizing the generosity that it was not long. He didn't hesitate. He didn't wait. And jaa bi'ajlin hanif. Okay. We're not talking about the Hanif we get from the Yemeni restaurant, okay? <laughs> but it's actually very similar. That's where the word comes from. The word Hanif is something that is roasted, right? So something that is, um, you know, something that is cooked. You know, it's like uh, stuffed or wrapped, right? So it's cooked for a long time and it becomes um, very soft. So bi'ajlin Hanif. So he brought him this fat roasted calf. Again, a lot of detail. Um, so it must have great importance because it shows that Ibrahim did not withhold anything from his guests. So they exchanged their greetings of salam, the greetings of all of the anbiya, and he presented them, and we see that, right? So Jewish people, they say shalom. Originally, in the Jewish text, we find, uh, in, in the Christian text, in the New Testament, we see also greetings of peace throughout it. And of course, uh, this ummah is the ummah of salam. This is the Ummah of greetings of salam. Even we just finished our salah. What do we say? Allahumma anta salam wa minka salam wa ilayka yarju salam. Ahiyana rabbana bis salam wa adakhilna al jannata dar al salam. So everything, Allah is the source of all peace, right? So this is something which was given to all of the anbiya and all of the prophets, and this ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam has preserved it better than anyone else. So he presented them with this whole calf. Then Allah says, 
فلما رأى أيديهم لا تصل إليه نكرهم وأوجس منهم خيفة قالوا لا تخف إنا أرسلنا إلى قوم لوط And when he saw that their hands لا تصل إليه that their hands did not reach for the food أوجس منهم خيفة He began to become fearful of them they, re they reassured him, don't be afraid. And we are angels sent only against the people of Lut, the people of Lot. So here, of course, he has bent over backwards in order to receive them, to be generous to them. And they're not even eating. They won't even go for the food. And so he starts talking a little bit. He starts taking a little bit of the food to encourage them. Again, uh, you may have heard me before uh, you know, mashallah, especially people from Muslim-majority countries, we have inherited that tradition of generosity. I have traveled, you know, all over the Muslim world and everywhere we go. Uh, you would think they would hear, oh, you're a Muslim from America, and they would think like you have lots of money, or people tell you, they say, oh, if people know you're from America, they're going to try and rip you off. Only if you go to the tourist souk does that happen. When you interact with people, that will never happen, right? There are certain places where that happens. Otherwise, it doesn't with the regular people. In fact, it's the opposite. People will invite you to the humblest houses that they have, and they will serve you from the best food and the best that they have. Haven't we all experienced that generosity? You know? And when you visit the, the, the Bedouins in, in Arabia today, they will receive you exactly the same way, and you'll experience it firsthand. So here, he. Um, just as a side point, since, mashallah, within our cultures, many of our cultures, there's a tradition of honoring the guest. But a lot of us, we, we are following our cultural practices more than the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. And when you reflect on the sunnah, you find that it's actually more rational and makes a lot more sense. So, for example, you know, uh, my parents are from the South Asian culture, right? So sometimes people will bend over backwards in order to receive their guests out of generosity and out of excitement for having a guest in doing khidmah, in trying to serve the, uh, the guests, but it borders on takalluf, right? Then the person become instead of being comfortable because of that excessive generosity, what ends up happening? When somebody is over you and serving you and saying, take more, and like you're kind of forced to eat the, the dish that you don't like, so what ends up happening with the guests? they become more shy, they become more uncomfortable. Hasn't it happened to all of us? So we notice from the sunnah of the Messenger وسلم, is that rather than being eating later or being the last to eat, when did the Prophet وسلم, eat when he had guests? He would be the very first person to start eating. And that would be odd in many of our cultures. But the reason the Prophet وسلم, used to be the first one to take a little bit of the food was to make the guests be at ease. As you know, in Arab cultures, they say ahlan wa sahla, right? So uh, there's two parts to that. Ahl means family. Right? Well, the meaning is welcome, but ahl means family. So this is a maf'ul bihi, actually, right? Or it's a maf'ul mutlaq, right? That feel that you are part of our family. So feel that part is mahdhuf, it's missing. But what's understood when you say ahlan, that means you're one of us. Be at ease. Wasahla. So again, that's maf'ul mutlaq or maf'ul bihi, the direct object, which means be completely comfortable and be at ease. Right? And I think this is a beautiful tradition. This is a beautiful way of welcoming people. And then sometimes people get shy because they're talking and they're eating. And then what ends up happening, the, the, the host you know, stops eating. And what ends up happening with the guest? they stop eating also because they're like, well, this is awkward, you know? They may not have finished, but they're gonna stop because they don't wanna be the only one eating. So the messenger sallallahu would be the very last person to eat. That means he would start first and he would end last. So he would prolong his meal and eat slowly in order to be the first and the last. So that way the guest is completely comfortable and starts and stops, you know, as, as, as they wish. So this is just a reminder, there are certain adab of hosting and, and receiving guests that, you know, we can observe. And when you, when you implement it and you try it in your life, you're gonna appreciate it. 
you're going to see, wow, there's great wisdom in the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. But in this case, he starts eating and they don't follow him. So now he starts to get scared. Now, you know, when you read the ayah, you know, that he sees qalu la takhaf, before qalu la takhaf, he said that la tasilu ilayh, that their hands are not reaching the food, fa'ujasaf minhum khifa. So he became scared. So it's like, okay, well, okay, so maybe they're not hungry. Like, why is he so scared of people who don't eat? But it indicates the, 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 the mind of Ibrahim that he is sensing something is off. You know, are these, are these aliens? Are these angels? Are these people? So he's getting suspicious. Something is odd. Something is weird. And so then he discovers that they have two missions. The first one is a stopover mission, all right, which is to deliver the good news of a son. And then there's a second piece of news, a second mission, which is that they're actually on their way to destroy the people of Lut. So it's very interesting how you know the angels they're able to multitask because you think like okay these are the angels of destruction these are the angels of bushra of giving good news but actually Allah subhanahu wa taala is using the same angels for both missions so Allah says again there's a wisdom in that I'm going to go to this in a second. Now, in Arabic, there is this thing called iltifat, right? And we see that I mentioned in British um, uh, literature, you'll see that as well. This is one of the stylistic elements that you see in different literature around the world, which is that you'll be talking about something, and then in the middle of the story, you'll suddenly change pronouns, and you'll talk about someone else. And then you'll go back to whatever it was that you were talking. So it's like, it's like an aside. Right? So we see this because right now there's a conversation between three angels, right? but we don't, we're just finding out that they're angels. Inna ursilna, we were sent to you. And Ibrahim. So who else is in this gathering? No one. According to what we know. No one else has been mentioned. We know four people. That's what we know. As soon as we start, get to the baby, who becomes the focus of the conversation? Sara, his wife, suddenly the, the, the person, all the attention shifts to Sara away from Ibrahim. So Allah doesn't mention that we told Ibrahim and Sara. He says, And his wife was standing by, so she laughed. Then we gave her, We gave her, uh, and so we gave him the, her the news of Ishaq, and after Ishaq, the news of Yaqub, Jacob. So that means that she overheard the news that they're on their way to go to the people of Lut. And the Mufassirin, they said that her laugh, laugh means, doesn't mean laugh the way that we laugh. It means that she smiled, indicating that finally something is being done about the people of Lut. It doesn't mean that she's pleased at their punishment. But it means that she's pleased that something is being is happening, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has decide, decided what to do as to the matter of the people of Lut. So when she laughed, then she's given this good news that she is already expecting a child. And that is the child is Haq. And at that moment, she is 90 years old. I mean, she has long forgotten the idea of having a child. Now this is very important because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is emphasizing delivering the, the message to Sarah, independent of delivering the message to Ibrahim. Whereas with the news of, of Ismail, so that news went to Ibrahim, right? Now here's the thing, because now they have a child, Ismail, but who still doesn't have a child? Ibrahim has a child, Hajar has a child, but Sarah has still not born any child. So it shows how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is so attentive of Sarah independent. So it's not it's Ibrahim plus his wife Sarah, but her as her own person. 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving attention to the fact of her experience of not being able to bear children and it seemed completely far-fetched. How could it happen now? Ana ajuz. I am I reached old age and this is my husband and he is even older than me. قالت يا ويلتا أألد وأنا عجوز وهذا بعلي شيخا إن هذا لشيء عجيب. So when I was young, I couldn't bear children. So now that I'm 90 years old, I'm gonna have a child now, and my husband is even older than me. He was 85 before at the time of marriage to Haja, 86 at the time of Ismail's birth. And now he's 120 years old. Is it possible that a 90-year-old and a 120-year-old will have a baby? This is impossible. This is amazing. Ajib, this is this is uh, she's astonished that it could be possible. This is an astonishing thing. Then the angels. Rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu alaykum ahlal bayt Innahu hamidun majeed They responded, ata'ajabina min amrillah Are you astonished by Allah's decree? And it doesn't mean that she was not accepting of Allah's decree It means that she couldn't imagine it It was beyond what she was able to, 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 to even think about May Allah's mercy and blessings be upon you, O people of this house. Indeed, he is praiseworthy, all glorious. Now, by the way, there's a little nugget in here, which is that there was another piece of good news that was contained within there, which is that she would also have a grandson, Yaqub, and that she would be old enough to see him. Right? Because if, she, if, if Allah is giving her the bushra, the good news of Yaqub, it implies that she would experience the feeling of being a grandmother, you know. Um, and that is also an allusion here to how being a grandparent is a special experience and something that is different from the feeling and experience and the love that one has with their own children. And then Allah says, فَلَمَّا ذَهَبَ عَنْ إِبْرَاهِيمَ الرَّوْعُ وَجَاءَتْهُ الْبُشْرَى يُجَادِلُنَا يُجَادُنُنَا فِي قَوْمِ لُوطٍ This is in 74. Then after the fear had left Ibrahim, so now he's starting to digest the good news. The good news had reached him, so he's like trying to compute. Okay, I got it. You know, because he's overwhelmed. I mean, he's afraid. Then he's getting this unimaginable news. يُجَادِلُنَا فِي قَوْمِ لُوطٍ Then it registers. Oh man, these angels are on their way to destroy all of the people of Lut. What about Lut? What about the believers? So then he started to plead, Yujadiluna, right? So he is pleading with the angels for the people of Lut, right? He's worried about them. Then Allah says, Inna Ibrahim halimun awahum mubin. Truly Abraham was forbearing. He was halim, awah. He was tender-hearted. He was ever turning to his Lord. Why? Because Ibrahim, because of his gentle nature, he always saw the good in people. Just like our Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Right? And so it's not about good and bad. Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala knows everyone's future. So when Allah punishes someone, by definition, they deserve it. We don't need to investigate. We don't need to look into it. The Allah is all just. So by definition, when they're being punished, it means that they deserve it. We don't need to look any further. right? Some people get confused about this point, that how could Allah destroy a people? Well, He knows every single person and what they're doing. So He knows exactly who to punish and who not to punish. right? But because of the gentle nature, Allah explains, Inna Ibrahim, He was Halim, He was Awa, He was Munib. So because of the gentle nature, you always thought that people could be better. Just like, who does that remind us of? Our Messenger, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, particularly in the most difficult day in his life, which was not Uhud. He told his wife, the most difficult day in my life, it was not the Battle of Uhud. Instead, it was Taif. When he was in Taif and the, the angel came with the full authority, 
to crush them with the mountains, to punish them. However, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa is given a blank check. What do we need to do? We'll take care of them. They deserve it. But Allah, the Prophet ﷺ said, perhaps min aslabihim, that from the, if they will not accept it, perhaps from their descendants. And today, if you go to a Ta'if, you will find the best of people. You will find that the people there are very, very devout. And you'll find that those were the people who most supported Abu Bakr radiallahu an in the Hurub al Ridda. So look at the foresight and thinking of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So Ibrahim, he never asked uh, you know, for a nation. He is one of the prophets who never prayed against his people. In his whole life, he never prayed for a single person to be destroyed or for people, for a nation to be punished. So this is one of, and Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala is telling us that we should take Ibrahim as an example, right? It doesn't mean that there are not people who deserve to be punished, but that we shouldn't seek the punishment. Similarly, the Prophet ﷺ, there is a sunnah. Sometimes people get confused. The Prophet ﷺ, he made dua against enemies. He did on many, many occasions. He would, and he would name them. And he would ask that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would grant them victory and destroy the enemies. But he didn't ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to send down punishment the way that some people are very apt you know, to just dish out because they feel that they know better. <clears throat> then in 76, Allah says, Ya Ibrahim, a'rid an hadha innahu qad jaa'a amru rabbik wa innahum atihim a'adhaabun ghayru mardood. The angel said, Oh Ibrahim, stop this. A'rid an hadha. Don't plead anymore. It's not that his pleading, he's pleading because he's worried about punishment because of his soft nature. But they're saying, Innahu qad jaa amru rabbi. So they're trying to explain to him. <clears throat> it may not be that he's not asking for anything improper, but his pleading has no purpose. Why? Because your Lord's decree has already come. And they will certainly be afflicted with a punishment that cannot be averted. That means that once Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has decreed a matter, it is impossible to reverse. So then somebody might ask, well, why do we make dua? Right? The Prophet ﷺ, he said that nothing changes al-qadr about uh, destiny except for a dua. So how is it possible? So you may have heard my analogy in the past. That think of, you know, when you're, uh, when you're editing a document. So you have uh, different track changes. So you have the original version, then you have the first draft, the second draft, the edited, right? And so sometimes the document can go in different directions. But you can, there's a history of all of the track changes. And then when you want, you can accept the changes and make final. Right? Many of us, we do that. I mean, I love using track changes. So that's how I run my business. Because later on, you, can, you don't have to read the whole 50-page thing all over again just because somebody changed a couple sentences. All of that is indicated there. But the final version, that is the one that is mubram. That is the one that has been authenticated. That is the one that has been confirmed. So when we talk about the qadr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the qadr that would have happened if you didn't pray is a theoretical qadr. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala already knew you were going to pray and that that qadr would be changed. So think of that as a first draft. But that was never going to happen. Because Allah knew that you're going to pray. And then you make your dua and your dua causes a change in that first draft and the final draft is the real qadr. And you're making dua and your dua making a change to the qadr is all part of the qadr. So that is in the log. That is in the history of the Qadr that you would pray and that it would cause this change. And the, the one that didn't actually play out is purely the theoretical. It was never ever going to happen. So this is what we mean. This is how we reconcile what we know about destiny with what the Prophet ﷺ has decided. In this case, the angels are saying, Qad ja amru rabbik. The order has already come from your Lord. That means that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has this decreed and decided what should happen, right? And so this is not open to any further discussion. 
but he was reassured that Lut and his believers would be saved and the angels left. So as I mentioned, they gave two pieces of news and they gave two gifts to him. They And what are the two gifts? They told him that prophethood would remain in your progeny, in your family, and revelation. The, all of the books of Allah that are to come, they will all run through your family. No other family is going to receive it. Allah says that. وَوَهَبْنَا لَهُ إِسْحَاقَ وَيَعْقُوبَ كُلًّا هَدَيْنَا وَنُوحًا هَدَيْنَا مِنْ قَبْلِ وَمِنْ ذُرِّيَّتِهِ دَاوُدَ وَسُلَيْمَانَ وَأَيُّوبَ وَيُوسُفَ وَمُوسَى وَهَارُونَ وَكَذَلِكَ نَجْزِ الْمُحْسِنِينَ Look how Allah so beautifully lays out this how he was generous and how he elevated the family of Ibrahim. And we blessed him with Ishaq and Yaqub. We guided them all as we previously guided Noah and those among his descendants, David, Solomon, Job, Joseph, Moses, and Aaron. This is how we reward the good doers. Likewise, we guided Zachariah, John, Jesus, and Elias, who were all of the righteous. وَإِسْمَعِيلَ وَالْيَسَعَ وَيُونُسْ وَلُوطَ وَكُلًّا فَضَّلْنَا عَلَى الْعَالَمِينَ We also guided Ishmael, Elisha, Jonah, and Lot, favoring each over other people. وَفَضَّلْنَاهُمْ That we, وَكُلًّا فَضَّلْنَا عَلَى الْعَالَمِينَ That each and every one, we favor them over all people of their time. That means that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him the blessing of keeping the family business within the family, right? So now you have this prophethood and they're all other families. So for example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, inna Allah istafa Adama wa Nuha wa ala Ibrahim wa ala Imran ala alamin. Allah mentions four in the Quran, that he chose Adam, he chose Noah, he chose the family of Ibrahim, and he chose the family of Imran. But the family of Ibrahim out of these four is elevated even more. Right? Because most of the prophets that we know, they are descendants of Ibrahim. And he decreed that the Messenger Sallallahu Allah, the best of all of Allah's creation, would be a descendant of Ibrahim. And so why is this happening? Why is Ibrahim blessed with all of this? This is not disconnected from what we've been talking about for the last two weeks. It's because Ibrahim passed those tests. It's because of his sacrifice. It's because of his willingness to do anything, his devotion to the message, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's blessings started to flow. And when Allah's blessings start to come, they come without any stop. So notice it wasn't like, you know, Ibrahim is not, we, there's no mention of Ibrahim continuing to pray for a child, right? It's not like in, 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 in Surah Maryam, right? So in which Zakaria is continuing to pray. Here, there's no mention of Sarah praying. There's no mention of Ibrahim continuing to pray for a baby. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knew what was in their heart. And so because of that, he granted it to them, right? And he favored them. Why? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives everything in its due time. And many of us, we start to have this, we start to hasten. We start to get anxious. We pray for something, it didn't happen. We lose hope. Or we're like, oh, my prayer was not answered. How do you know the way that your prayer is answered? It could be answered in this world. It could be answered in the afterlife. It could be some harm that's, uh, that's averted because of your dua. Or it could be that you're receiving it, but later. So Allah favored all of them. And then in the end, Ibrahim alayhi salam, he passed away in what uh, uh, the Jewish community calls the cave of the patriarch, right? And uh, Muslims mostly, we accept that this is historically accurate, that this is the location that Ibrahim uh, alayhi salam was buried, and this is located in Hebron, in Al-Khalil. It's a very, very militarized zone, very tense place to visit. But it's also a beautiful thing to see Jews, Christians, and Muslims, even despite everything that's going on there, to see that this is a place that is revered and loved by so... I mean, 
obviously we have a lot in common. Otherwise, why would we all be going to the same place? Right? The same with Jerusalem, um, which means that you know we are following a very similar legacy. Now, I want to <clears throat> share one more story for today, um, which is a lesson in the hospitality of Ibrahim. Um, and this is from you know the pre-Islamic text, but it has been transmitted in the Islamic text as well. And this is about his generosity other than what's mentioned in the Quran, right? It, as we mentioned, Ibrahim would never eat without guests joining him. In fact, on this particular instance, three days had passed in which there were no guests that passed on the main road. And so what did he do? He refused to eat. For three days he didn't eat, just in anticipation of a guest arriving. So on the third day, he still couldn't find anybody. Nobody came. And he went out in search of somebody traveling or somebody passing through and finally he was able to find someone and he brought him and he said come 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 you know come visit me i want a guest to eat with me and so this is an elderly man that joined him and then ibrahim alayhi salam he recites before eating what does he say he says bismillah now remember we talked about a ta'if remember when the prophet sallam, um, uh, took some shade in the garden who did he find there in that fateful day? Who received him there? There was a young Christian boy. There was a young Christian boy that presented some grapes to the Prophet ﷺ that worked in that orchard and gave him some water and you know tried to assist the Messenger ﷺ in that. And when uh, the Prophet ﷺ said, Bismillah rahman rahim the boy was surprised at how do you know that? Because the, the basmala is something that he also did. And he said that he is from the people of Nineveh, from the people of Yunus alayhi salam. So we notice again, salam is common. The basmala is also common. He begins with bismillah before taking the food. Now this old man who's a traveler, he's coming from another land, right? He doesn't know Ibrahim. He never heard bismillah before, right? And the old man, what does he say? Absolutely nothing. He doesn't say basmalah like his host says. So Ibrahim, he said, why aren't you remembering Allah before you take your meal? I mean, what's wrong? Isn't Allah our creator? Isn't he our nourisher? Isn't he Rabbul Alameen? He is our master. He's our Lord. Isn't it suitable that we should remember him before we partake in the food that has been provided by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Right? Christian people, they say grace, right? Before, uh, uh, before they have their food. And our tradition, uh, most of our dua are after we have our food because that's when we need to express our thanks. And so Ibrahim is surprised, like, what's wrong with this guy? And he asks him, are you Muslim? And he says, no. He said, well, if, you're not, if you don't believe in God, what do you believe in? I mean, who are you? And he says, I am actually a fire worshiper. So he told him, he said, be a Muslim, and then I'll have you as a guest. Until you say Bismillah, until you recognize that this food is from God, you're not welcome here. You cannot share the food with me. And he said, no, I'm not interested in becoming Muslim. I don't believe in this God that you're talking about. So he said, okay, well, I'm not going to permit you to be here. And he sent him away. So they parted. Goodbye. After that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent the angel Jibreel alayhi salam to Ibrahim. He said, why did you do this? Why did you send that man away without receiving any food? And Ibrahim, he's a prophet of God. He said, he doesn't believe in Allah. He's a kafir. I invited him to Islam. He rejected it. He's a disbeliever. I asked him to be a servant of Allah, and he said no. He said, I'm a servant of the fire. So Ibrahim seems to be making a compelling argument, right? That he doesn't, how can he deserve the food that you're providing and he doesn't even acknowledge your existence? He doesn't even recognize that it came from you. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent Jibreel with a message that this man is more than 70, he's 80 or 90 years old, right? All these years, all 70 years of, of his adult life, I have known that he doesn't worship me, that he worships the fire, and I have continued to provide his risk. I have continued to provide his provision. I feed him, 
and I give him everything that he needs. Allah has given us everything that we ask for. Only once you were called to deliver food to this man and to provide him from risk, but you refuse to do it. I've been doing it for more than 70 years. You couldn't do it once. Go run after him and bring him back to eat. So Ibrahim alayhi salam, he runs after him. He finds him in the end and he says, come back to eat. The man is very surprised. He said, didn't you throw me out because I told you that I'm a fire worshiper? I mean, you, you got rid of me. Why are you now chasing after me and coming and inviting me to come with you? He said, I was angry with you because you don't believe in God. And Allah Azza wa Jal, he said that he fed you for 70 years and you didn't worship him. And just once I couldn't feed you. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala got angry with me and told me that I should bring you again. When he heard this, he said, you must be right. What a generous God you have. I must be in your religion and to be Muslim. And he became Muslim as a result of this. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not distinguish between his servants. He gives all of them, right, provision. But what's important and the difference between the believer and the disbeliever is that we are thankful. وَلَا إِن شَكَرْتُمْ لَأَزِيدَنَّكُمْ If you but give thanks, then Allah will increase you. وَلَا إِن كَفَرْتُمْ إِنَّ عَذَابِي لَشَدِيدٌ and so this is the teaching of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the anbiya. There's some lessons here that no matter how good you are, no matter how righteous you are, even as a prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you don't have the right to judge the person. Because all you're seeing is the snapshot of the person in time. You're not seeing the totality of the person. You're seeing them in that given moment. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when He judges us, He judges us in totality, without any missing information, and with perfect knowledge, and with perfect power, and with perfect wisdom. So Allah knows best, that's number one. Number two is to ask for forgiveness and to seek the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the third lesson is that we should be generous without reservation, that we should always entertain and be hospitable to other people. There's karam, which is generosity. There's jud, which is excessive to give the best that you have. And then the third level, which is that which is Allah praises from the ansar, which is ithar. That is when you prefer others over yourself. I want to just um, answer one question that I'm anticipating. In the past, Sister Zamruda and a few other people, they asked about suhuf Ibrahim, about the scrolls of Ibrahim. So since I'm anticipating the question, why not? So there's a, a story of a traveler that appears at Badir Zaman. You know, in, the, in Turkey, there's a famous tafsir called Risala i Nur by Badir Zaman. Um, and he mentions in there an Eastern fable. Um, and he analyzes this story in, in his Risala about a story of a traveler. And what's interesting is that the story of the traveler, <coughs> you find in Islamic texts, you find in Jewish texts, you even find it in the book, The Confession, which was written by Leo Tolstoy. So you guys know Leo Tolstoy, right? He is the author of War and Peace and Anna Karenina. If you have like a rainy day for like four or five days, you can read these books. They're like <laughs> enormous, but very, very beautiful. One of the best authors in all of human history. Russian literature is one of the best. Um, so he told, so he mentions the same, and he describes it as an Eastern fable. So it appears in Russian literature. It's mentioned as man in well. There's a legend of two Christian martyrs that come from India. And then we also find it in early Buddhist literature. So this is, and then, you know, there's a little twist on the sto traveler story in which it involves two brothers. There's one brother who's obedient and wise, and there's another one that is rebellious. Now, because of this, I don't know if theologians are not interested in this story, but historians find this super fascinating. This is one story that is like in every country. How is it possible? Like every religion, every people, all the, it's the same story repeated again and again. So we don't have the suhuf of Ibrahim. It does not exist, right? People, they say, oh, it's the Dead Sea. The Dead Sea Scrolls are not suhuf of Ibrahim, right? Maybe it might have some lessons or some uh, teachings. These are rabbinical teachings, and 
uh, some portions of the Torah that are in the Dead Sea Scrolls. But, you know, which goes back, I think, 2,000 years or so, um, maybe a little bit more, right? But it's not the Suhuf of Ibrahim. We don't have them. Um, but the, the, there is a lesson. And Dr. Tariq, uh, our scholar in residence, he has mentioned that this is indicative that there may have been prophets that were sent to India, to China, to other places around the world. And uh, adding to what Dr. Tariq uh, mentioned, I think that at the, at the time period that we're talking about, which goes back thousands of years, if you have these tens of thousands of prophets, they're not teaching the Quran, Quran hasn't been revealed. They are not teaching the Torah, the Torah has not been revealed, right? They're not teaching the Bible, the Bible has not been revealed. What are they teaching? What's out there? They're teaching the Suhaf of Ibrahim. So it's possible, and I'm not saying this religiously, I'm saying it historically, that it's very possible that the reason that there are some fables and some stories and legends that are found throughout the world is because they could have been originally contained either within the Suhaf of Ibrahim itself or in the early teachings of the disciples and the students and the early generations that were following Ibrahim السلام, because they give teachings of worshiping Allah, of doing what's right, doing what's just. They teach ethics and morality. So it could be that the Suhaf of Ibrahim ended up being disseminated throughout the entirety of the earth, which is kind of a harbinger. This is kind of a predictor of uh, the messenger Muhammad وسلم, who also has a global mission and has a global revelation that has touched and reached every single corner of the earth. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he unites the ummah of Muhammad وسلم, and allows us to follow in the footsteps of Ibrahim alayhi salam. We'll take some uh, questions. Um, while we get the microphone, there's uh, one from Sister Shanaz. On dua, can you please revise instances when prophets didn't get their duas accepted in the dunya? Okay, this is a tough one. Aside from Nuh alayhi salam and how they reacted to that. I heard a hadith about guests. When guests come, they take out the bad things from the house as they leave. This is, is this a sahih hadith? Um, for the first question, I'm not aware of any dua from a prophet that has not been accepted. There are instances of duas being delayed in the response, but they're not delayed. To us, they're delayed. We're not getting a response right away. In fact, everything happens exactly in the right time. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala delays a response, it's because it wasn't supposed to happen in that time. So we ask for what we want, but Allah gives us what we need. So in fact, when we examine all the duas of the, of the anbiya, we find that all of their prayers are answered. And in fact, we see we're in the month of Rabi al Awwal. And experientially, this is tajriba, as Dr. Tariq mentioned. This is, a, this is a matter of experience that people have passed along. We find that people who say a lot of salawat on the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, this is a door of qabul, this is a door of acceptance. And they tend to be people who all of their duas are answered. So this is a good suggestion for people who find that I'm making prayers, I'm not getting an answer. So perhaps you can try the door of the beloved of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Not that you have to, you can ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala directly, you don't have to. Some people get confused. But if you go that route, it brings you closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, actually, I gave the khutbah this Friday, since Dr. Tariq's been giving the khutbah this month, so I've been kind of on tour, right, going different places. So I gave the khutbah last Friday in Alexandria. And um, somebody asked the question, they said, well, why do you guys emphasize saying salawat on the Prophet ﷺ? Shouldn't we remember Allah? When we say dhikr, shouldn't be remembering Allah? I t and I answered this question very simply, that it's not possible to send salawat on the Prophet ﷺ without praying to Allah. As soon as you say, Allahumma salli, then oh Allah. So every prayer on the Prophet is a dua to Allah and a dhikr of Allah automatically, right? 
So this is why I strongly recommend there is no such thing as too much salawat. There is no limit to it. And if you make all of your adhkar salawat, so you wouldn't be remiss. You're not missing anything. Um, so that would be my uh, answer to the first one, that their duas are accepted, but they will be accepted in different ways. And the second one, that when the hadith guests, they, they, uh, when the guests arrive, uh, when they leave, they take out the bad things from the house. This is a good hadith. As you know, we have weak hadith, that which is good, that which is hasan, and that which is sahih. Uh, my recollection is that this is a good hadith. It could be sahih, but I don't recall whether it is sahih or not. But a good hadith will be taken anyway. So this is a hadith which will be taken. Right? Whether it is good or sahih, we, 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 can, we can apply that hadith for, as long as it's not from one of the categories of weak hadith which we will not legislate from. And this also comes from the door of fada'il al-a'mal, from encouraging people to do good deeds. So even if it were a weak hadith, so for example, seek knowledge even to China. You guys know I mentioned that as a very weak hadith. You know, there are some names in the chain. We're like, we don't know who they are. It's not like, it's not mawdu'ah, it's not fabricated, but it's a weak hadith, right? But why is the ummah, we never stressed out about this until nowadays people like start arguing about all kinds of stuff. Like no, it never bothered anyone meaning, uh, reading that hadith, why? Because we have like 500 authentic hadith about seeking knowledge. So if we have one weak hadith that says go to China, it seems a little far-fetched. It's probably the Prophet didn't say it. But if he said it, it, it matches everything else that we have within our religion. So it is completely acceptable for a Muslim to narrate that hadith, um, even though it's weak. So if, if, this is not a weak hadith, but even if it was, it would be permissible to narrate it even, even if it was a weak hadith, because of the category that it falls within, and Allah knows best. Okay. Uh, we have a couple of questions. Yeah, go ahead. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam. Did Prophet Ibrahim have a third wife, or is that only in the Christian Judaic test? test? So this is going to be in the I don't know bucket, <laughs> you know, because uh, what's mentioned in the Quran and the Hadith is two wives. We do know that at that time, people had multiple wives. Uh, in fact, a lot of the prophets had fewer wives than, than others did. Similarly, Islam, it limited, you know, people to four wives at a time in which people would have a lot more than that. Is it possible that Ibrahim had more than two wives as is narrated in the, in the Jewish text um, and, and the Christian text as well by extension? It, it's very possible, but it's not relevant to, to the story. And this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he gives us the most salient points that, that we should emphasize. Um, and also the, as a side point, you know, it, the dynamic between Hajar and Sara and this supposed jealousy, you know, it, it features very uh, prominently in the Jewish text. But you don't find that at all in Islam. In fact, it's quite the opposite. We find that in the Islamic text that they're on the same page and that, in fact, she's the one that gifts Sarah, uh, gifts Hajar to Ibrahim, and she's the one that insists to do it. Which also shows that, you know, if somebody is going to take... You know, as you know, in Islam, there are scenarios uh, in which it is permissible. But just because something is permissible doesn't mean it's wise. You know, so whenever people uh, ask about a second wife, I'm like, guys, as soon as you perfect your first marriage, then you can start thinking about a second one, right? And so, of course, that never happens, right? <laughs> because, you know, we're all works in progress. So is it, it, it's, I think it's a beautiful thing in Islam how... Sarah is the one that suggests this, um, as opposed to Ibrahim. You know, can you imagine, because she's already feeling down because she's not able to have a child. So then, to imagine the rejection of, okay, well, since you couldn't do it, I'm gonna go marry somebody else and I'm gonna go have a child with them. So I think it's, it's very important for us that, that this is not something which came from Ibrahim, but rather it's something that came from, I think that that, that, that indicates their uh, pure nature and their pure uh, intention. But as to whether he had uh, additional wives beyond that, uh, we don't know. Allah knows best. So I think we have another question. Yeah. Um,
Assalamu alaikum. Uh, acceptance of du'a is a is a. I give you an example right here. Sure. When Prophet Ibrahim and Ismail built the Kaaba, hmm. they made a du'a at that yeah. time. Oh Allah, send a prophet among this nation who will teach your ayat so the people can be on a righteous path. Hmm. Right? How long that du'a was completed? Thousands of years. Hmm. You see. Talking about you know acceptance of the du'a, we get impatient in that way. So right. after thousands of years, that du'a was you know accepted, and the prophet came, and the ummah of you know Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. We are here. Right. What we are doing today is the du'a. We were fulfilling the du'a of Prophet Ibrahim. We are learning the Quran. We are learning the ayat of Allah. Right. So the acceptance of du'a. Is a is you you should not be impatient yeah. accepting that oh it didn't happen because you know it happened. Yeah. Thousands of years. Subhanallah. Beautifully stated. I can't add anything to that. Beautifully stated. Jazakallah. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam. Uh, just one curious question is that um, we read in the Quran, Rabbi Subhana said, "Ala Rasul la nufarriqu bain ahad min hum." Yet so far, I never heard like a hadith or an Islamic text about uh, the benefits of salat on other prophets. Okay. So, so is there anything on that that you can enlighten us with? Sure. Okay. So there are actually like, it's a short question, but there are like three questions in there. <laughs> Mashallah. You have, a, you're very succinct. Right? <laughs> so, um, so the first part is the ayah, la nufarriqu bayna ahadin min rusuli in Surah Al-Baqarah. This ayah is often misunderstood by a lot of people. So uh, here, آمَنَ الرَّسُولُ بِمَا أُنزِلَ إِلَيْهِ مِنْ رَبِّهِ وَالْمُؤْمِنُونَ كُلٌّ آمَنَ بِاللَّهِ وَمَلَائِكَتِهِ وَكُتُبِهِ وَرُسُولِهِ So we all believe in their Rusul. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent down all of the Anbiya, all of the Prophets. Out of these Anbiya, think Venn diagram. This is all Anbiya. Then within there, you have a small group of Rusul. At the Anbiya, this is over 100,000, it's a big number. Then the Rusul, these are smaller in number, these are the ones that have a mission. They have, you know, uh, they have text and they, they're directed to specific people. They have some, they, uh, some of them, they have shir'atan wa minhaja, they have a sharia, they have a new way of doing things, they might have prayer as a component, um, right? So for example, like Jews, they pray three times a day, some pray more than that, right? So one of them was established by Abraham, one was established by Moses. So, you know, they continue to follow that tradition in the morning and, and in the evening. Like if you go to the airport, right? A lot of times you'll see like an LL uh, uh, flight and you'll see like a lot of Jewish people. So then you end up seeing Muslims and Jews praying next to each other in the airport. Has anyone seen that? Because we're all praying at the same Maghrib time. Because they pray at sunset and we pray at sunset. And, and many times you see that we pray side by side, right? Um, and they also face, you know, basically almost the same direction. Um, so out of a rusul, then you have ulul azmi min a rusul, right? So these are the ones of, you know, uh, the the top prophets, right? So we had mentioned Nuh previously as an example of that, and then Ibrahim is another example from the ulul azmi. So all the prophets are in different levels. And out of all of them, out of the Ulul Azm, you have the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, right? Um, and so he is Khatamun Nabiyun, Wa Imamun Muttaqeen. He is the seal of all of the Prophets. He is the best of all of Allah's creation and the best of all of the Prophets. Then the next ayah says, La nufarriqu bayna ahadin min rusuli. That we do not distinguish between any one of his Prophets. So doesn't that contradict what I just mentioned? It doesn't. Right? Because we do not distinguish as to the nature of what they brought. In what? In that they're calling to Allah. In that they're calling, in that they're bringing a divine scripture. In that they're reminding people. So for example, Jesus. He is affirming what came before to Moses. 
and he is also giving bushra. He's giving glad tidings of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So there are differences between the prophets, but not a qualitative difference. I mean, it's the difference is only in merit, but the difference is not in the nature of what they are bringing. Now, when we mention the other anbiya and the prophets, so we say alayhi salam, right? Now, why is it that sometimes we might say, oh, Abraham, Moses, like I just did, and I don't say alayhi salam? Now, the proper adab and etiquette would be to say alayhi salam each time. But there might be cases in which I'm distracted or you're distracted and you don't mention it, and it would be fine. But the greater adab, the greater etiquette in mentioning them is to send peace on them, right? So you could say, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, for the other anbiya. Why don't I do that? I can. I can say, sallallahu alayhi wa for the other anbiya. The reason, there's nothing wrong in saying salat and salam on the other prophets. But because the merit of the Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa is so special, I want to use different words for when I send salam to those prophets from when I mention the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa it's not that I can use a different formula. I don't have to use alayhi salam. I use alayhi salam because it's short and to the point. But I could use a longer formulation. So this takes us to the third question <laughs> in that one sentence, mashallah, which is why we emphasize so much sending durood and salawat on the Prophet wasallam, And that is because he told us to do so. right? And why did the Prophet wasallam, tell us to do so? Is it because the Prophet ﷺ is in need of those salawat? Is he? He's not. Is it because he wants that, like he needs attention, or he needs us to mention him, or he needs to curry favor with Allah? Hasha. Absolutely not. The Prophet ﷺ knows that he is the beloved to Allah. And he knows that our best chance of reaching Allah's rahmah is through salawat on him. So out of his love for his ummah, he wants his ummah to be attached to him because he is the one that can help us out as sahib al-shafa'ah, as the one that has shafa'ah. So it's not because of something he wants from us, it's because of something he wants for us. And this is why the Prophet ﷺ said that the one that does not do salat on me is only the miserly person. And that miserly person, if you don't give, then you won't receive. And this is why he also told us that whoever does salawat on me once, then sallallah, then Allah sends salat and salam on him ten times. So the angels, they will also pray for you. So this is why, yes, we can do the same for the other prophets, but I recommend that whatever we do for the prophets, it should be something which is special and different from the other. Yes, this is from Surah Al-Ahzab. Inna Allah wa malaikatahu yusalluna ala nabi Ya ayyuhaladina amanu sallu alayhi wa sallimu taslima. Um, so Dr. Dean, you didn't ask the question, but since you alluded to the ayah, everybody asked the question, how is it that Allah prays on the Prophet? Right? This is the first question that pops in the mind. That inna Allah wa malaikatahu yusalloon. So how is it that Allah, so because we say Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad, right? So how does Allah do that? When Allah sends salat, that means he raises him. He praises him. He elevates his status and his maqam. So Allah is doing salat. We are also doing salat. But Allah's salat on the Prophet is different from our salat on the Prophet. Um, thank you, uh, Imam. Um, I want to follow up on uh, Brother Musaddiq's point uh, about the learning opportunity that we have today mm. in following up on uh, Prophet Ibrahim mm. uh, Dua. Um, there's all, so that's a learning opportunity, but there's also a teaching moment mm. and listening to your very uh, engaging uh, interpretation of the surah. Mm. Uh, the, there's so much in the Prophet, uh, Prophet Ibrahim's uh, story mm. of etiquette saying Bismillah and everything else that goes with it, that this would be a great teaching moment mm. for children in our Sunday school mm. uh, because we ourselves uh, sort, sort of take these things for granted and over time these values fade. 
Yes. Uh, I'm reminded of uh, Pete, who was with us, and never would he uh, partake in our food <laughs> at breakfast mm. uh, without saying grace. And uh, even at my home, when he used to come and we'd give him something to eat, mm -hmm. he would say grace. And the effect of that is that he would never, f and he, he would see that we also say Bismillah. Mm. And the effect of that is that now, even though he's not here, even from Florida where he's sick and he's uh, recovering well, um, he sends messages to us using the Islamic calendar. You know, wow. He's a Christian, he's a Catholic, <coughs> right. uh, saying, you know, bless you all on this occasion and so on. So that's again a, a sort of learning and teaching opportunity. And I would urge you in the Islamic studies uh, program which you lead in the Sunday right. school right. to bring this up because uh, all of us and particularly the new generation uh, might dilute, might get diluted in the parents themselves, not insisting on some of these things. Alhamdulillah. This is a, b a beautiful suggestion, uh, Brother Mohsen. Alhamdulillah, I can state that we, we have it already in the curriculum. Uh, the story of Ibrahim that we mentioned here, it's in two different levels. I think in level uh, four and level six. Uh, so where we talk about the stories of the Prophet. So anyone who's interested, they can look at the curriculum. So we have weaved the verses of the Quran, the stories of the Prophet, ethics, morality, all of that is within our Sunday school uh, curriculum, alhamdulillah. And it, the idea is to not just teach the stories in the abstract, but give them a roadmap and a rubric in terms of how they should live an ethical and a moral life, uh, which is very important because you know implementing these values is more important than just learning them uh, theoretically, so alhamdulillah, we're doing that. And then uh, it's, it's a beautiful thing that you're mentioning, Pete, um, uh, very fondly. You know, it reminds us Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he mentions that you will find that the closest to you in faith will be from those who say that I am Christian. And Allah says the reason that the closest in faith to, to Muslims are Christians, because among them are qissisin, right? So they are... Uh, people who are devout and people who are uh, uh, attentive uh, to God and la yastakbirun, and they don't arrogate themselves. So this is a common theme we find within the Quran that there are many, many very, very sincere people that have a close relationship with God uh, from among Christians. We wish they would study the Quran, of course, and then be able to put that positive energy in the in the best direction but the but that clean heart is 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 very common uh, among devout christians and allah subhanahu wa ta'ala praises that within the quran and we've seen that within our own experiences assalamu alaikum wa alaikum assalam it's not a question it is just i want you your good sir to dilate upon it uh, prophet ibrahim alayhi salam he prayed for his progeny mm. to be to lead the mission of Islam forwards and it was forward by all the prophets Islam was being till now that is forward it was because of his dua and God chose only his family to all others in this mission mm -hmm. now there is a saying from Allah that I chose them by knowledge or all the other world or all the worlds but dikhtar nahum alai ala ilmin Al -al -al mm -hmm. this is, it is an ayah in, in Surah Dukhan. Mm -hmm. So is it this status, special status of that al -al -al over all the world we chose that, mm -hmm. that, that nation? Yes. Is it related to the, the dua of Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam? Oh yes, absolutely. That uh, this, I mean, there are probably five or six places um, where Allah, so, uh, in another verse, Allah says, Wa uh, 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 al -nubuwa, that he gave them also authority he gave them prophethood another one mentions three of them that we gave them knowledge and power and, and dominion and we gave them wisdom which is the three things that I mean what more do you want money, power, 
you know, wisdom, knowledge, respect, prestige. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave them everything. And all of that is the result of the du'as of Ibrahim, which was accepted. But two things can be true at the same time. One can be that Allah chose them, and it can also be the answer of du'a. It's not A or B, it's A and B. That they were chosen because Allah wanted it that way, and it also means that the du'a is accepted. Both are true. And that nation was the Jewish nation. It's Jewish in, this, in the ethnic sense. Right? So, so we don't dispute that Ishaq is Jewish, right? Israel means Yaqub, right? So these are from Bani Israel. So ethnically they're Jewish, but as Muslims we reject the concept that these are Jewish prophets, all right? These are prophets of God, all right? So this is how we view it from a theological perspective, but we don't dispute uh, history, we don't dispute ethnicity, you know? But for us, their mission is far beyond who's Arab, who's, who's Hebrew, who's Israeli, you know, from Bani Israel, you know, this message is transcendent, right? But in fact, the fact that Allah chose Bani Israel to have the most prophets means that they should be held to a higher standard. So it shouldn't be a source of pride that, oh, we got all these prophets, but rather it should be, wow, we got all these prophets, we need to really live up to this. So this is how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Al-Baqarah talks about it. And uh, so far as the thanks given to Allah so any for any bounty, he is always bountiful, always um, giving uh, his own beauty to us and he is, uh, we are always under his care. Yeah. And who has he always gives food. But the, God says that when he gives uh, wisdom to Luqman, and he, he so on and so said, be well, thankful. And, and whosoever thanks, he thanks for himself. Mm -hmm. And who doesn't thank, I am, I, and I, Latif, I, am uh, I am the one uh, who doesn't need it. Yeah. So he doesn't need it. I mean, we, whenever we thank for anything, we thank especially for ourselves. God doesn't know it at all. He doesn't need it. So what is your comment on it? Alhamdulillah, it's exactly like what you said. Allah says, وَلَقَدْ آتَيْنَا لَقُمَانَ الْحِكْمَةَ أَنْ يَشْكُرْ لِلَّهِ وَمَنْ يَشْكُرْ فَإِنَّمَا يَشْكُرْ لِنَفْسِهِ So whoever shows gratitude to Allah, then who's the ultimate recipient? Who's the beneficiary of that, shak of that shukr? Then you're the benefit because Allah is going to show you more grace and He's going to favor you and He's going to reward you. وَمَنْ كَفَرَ So if you reject it, don't think like, oh, I'm not going to believe. You know, sometimes atheists, they, they have that debate. It's like a little bit of a negotiation. So if you, if you turn away, if you reject it knowingly, so Allah is free from any want. So Allah is not in need. Qari Anas, he recited from Surah Muzammil on the Quran night, and he concluded with this ayah. That, وَمَا تُقَدِّمُوا لِأَنفُسِكُمْ مِنْ خَيْرٍ تَجِدُوهُ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ Whatever you present on behalf of yourselves, you will find it before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We're going to see all of it laid out. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala um, that he, you know, will raise us. Are there any other questions before we close the discussion? Um, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala raise us on account of the best that we used to do. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us, awzi'na an nashkura ni'matak, that we can show gratitude for your many bounties, O oh Allah, increase us. Allahumma zidna wa la tanqusna and don't uh, decrease us. Allahumma aghithna, Allahumma aghithna, ya mughith, ya hayu, ya qayyum. O oh, sustainer and O oh, generous one, we ask Allah that he continues to shower his many bounties over us. Subhana rabbika rabbil izzati amma sifun wa salamun ala al-mursaleen walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Thank you very much. Thank you.